God, we confess this morning that you are worthy to be praised, worthy to be loved with our whole heart and our whole mind, our whole soul and our whole strength. God, we worship you with all that we are. We confess that we need you, God, to be what we cannot be. To each other and to ourselves in this world, God, fill in the gaps. Help us to be the presence of Christ to those who need you most.
Indeed, we need the Lord. Half the reason why we gather is because we recognize our need for the Lord. We also recognize that we need to be uh, energized and transformed, in essence, by the gathering of people. So whether you're gathering here in person or if you're gathering online, um, it, it's this uh, need that we have to be with each other and to love the Lord our God and to do so with each other. So thank you for joining us here. Good morning. My name is Pastor Dale, and it's uh, my pleasure to bring uh, to you uh, some announcements first and then a message later on. But we'll also be celebrating communion here today. And so for those of you that are gathered, you've received a small thimble of uh, juice and a wafer. Uh, for those of you at home, you're invited to press pause or uh, whatever works to, to get some bread or some juice uh, in preparation for after the message where uh, we'll be engaging and celebrating uh, communion together. So look forward uh, to that later. Later on here in this message. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, one uh, is um, Christmas with Style is ramping up, and so we seek for your engagement there. Um, please talk to Melissa Hillary or uh, Judy or um, Gord Birdie. Gord? Yeah. And <laughs> sorry. Um, and so just, uh, just see how you can plug in. We, we, are, we are called to be such a blessing in, into this uh, city of Edmonton. And so we invite you to participate in that and with us and also other churches that we invite them to join us as well. Uh, speaking of giving and, and engaging in that, um, uh, the, the books, the financial books are being uh, completed um, from our past uh, previous uh, fiscal year, and so if at, you were there at the budget time, it, we were talking about 240000 might have uh, come in. Um, by the end of the, the month, we had actually received 290000 of tithes that come in for, from you to support the ongoing ministries of this church, and so we thank you so much. Uh, we still have a huge hurdle before us for next year, but thank you so much for engaging in all things um, that are the river. And so... Um, I think that's all I got for now, and so we're just going to turn it over to uh, uh, the message in a minute, or we'll start with a video. As it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things. All right, thank you, and uh, welcome to the fourth installment of our W5 uh, sermon series here this fall, uh, where we've been asking the questions, who, what, where, when, and why? And if you were with us from the very beginning, then you might remember the who we believe in. We believe in the Lord, the maker of heaven, who wants to be in relationship with us. Uh, the what we believe is that this Lord is constantly revealing himself to us through his word, through his son, and through his spirit, and he invites us to hear him and to listen. Uh, where, where do we practice these beliefs? Uh, we recognize that we do that in every aspect of our lives. As we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that those are also areas in which we grow and, uh, and experience and practice our faith, which leads us to today. When? When do we practice the who, the what, and the where of faith? Let's take a moment to pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, it is good to be gathered here today. We, Lord, are seeking your face. We are listening for your voice. We seek to know you and to respond to you. So reveal yourself, Lord, 
again today, as you do each and every day. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, and uh, may you speak to us and enable us to respond to you. This is our prayer in confidence that you do exactly that. So be with us here as we gather around these words in this moment. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. So I grew up in an immigrant community where we all belonged to the same church, all went to the same social gatherings, all went to the same school, and by the time I completed high school, our community had built their own college. Growing up inside of this bubble, I was taught to fear any and everyone else. I did not cross the Catholic school playground to walk to my school, even though it was a shortcut for fear of being bullied by the Catholic boys. Now, when I said I was taught, well, it was more caught than taught. Because no one outright said, you know, that everyone else is bad. <laughs> but I heard it in the tone and the derision of others. You probably heard the story of the woman who was suddenly taken up to heaven after she discovered Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Well, when she got there, um, St. Peter offered to give her a tour of heaven before she met Jesus face to face. There she saw a wonderful gathering of people all in white robes, singing and laughing and enjoying each other's company and, of course, enjoying the Lord's company. And then they walked past this big, tall brick wall. And she asked St. Peter what was on the other side. To which St. Peter replied, shh, the Christian Reformed people are on the other side and they think they're the only ones here. <laughs> now, truth be told, <laughs> it was we CRC folk who told this joke as if the Baptists were on the other side. But do you see how conditioning such talk was? How it informed the mind on what to think, not realizing that as we pointed fingers, there were three pointing back at us. Baptist and CRC peoples are not the only ones who grew up like this. We need only to look at other immigrants like Hutterites and Mennonites who have isolated themselves from the, the rest of society and, and from other Christian groups. And we just, we realize just how insular our thinking can become. I grew up in an insular community that isolated itself from the rest of Christianity and from society at large because it was of the mindset that we were the only chosen ones. Once I left high school behind and entered the real world, I started crossing paths with other Christians and I was pleasantly surprised. I recall the first time it happened. I was delivering groceries to a store owned by a Korean family, and the father one day said to me, he said, uh, you're a Christian, aren't you? <laughs> I was quite surprised by his guess and his gumption to ask, but it started a great conversation that opened my eyes and my heart. I discovered others who followed Christ were equally passionate and compelling. But I must say that this enlightenment of mine did not open my eyes to anyone outside of the church. It was still my impression that church was only for Christians. I mean, the only way into church was through birthright. You had to be born into a church family. Now, I'm exaggerating, but I suspect you get my point. It was not until Gloria and I joined the church plant that my eyes and my heart got opened wider. Church plant, that's a phrase that we use for when a large church says, you know, we should really start a another church in another geographical area, so let's plant a church over there. So, so church plant. Gloria and I joined uh, with John Van Sloten in Calgary, and as he was called to start this new church. We worked for six months with a group of 20 or more people who dedicated themselves um, to starting this church. And then on the first day of the worship services, the pastor had the Rolling Stones playing on the PA system as people came in. I can't get no satisfaction, was the song. 
And it was that day, it was that worship service, that I came to the conclusion that church was no longer just for me. As I encountered people entering church again for the first time from, from every other denomination known to Christ, and even a few atheists came in too, it was then that I saw that big, tall brick wall come tumbling down. And not only did I see that other denominations of Christ followers come together, but for the first time in my walk with Jesus, did I see unchurched people come to greet and accept Jesus as their Savior. And my heart has been opened to this ever since. So before we turn to God this morning to discover what he thinks about all of this, would you turn to someone beside you and share with them the, what experience, your experience has been in this regard? Is this something that you can identify with, you know, all that I've been talking about? Would you, would you share with them where your heart is at? So I'd like to give you a, a minute, half a minute to, to share that. If you're at home, um, talk to the person beside you. If you're sitting solo here or, or at home, I invite you to text. My phone number is up on the screen, 289-991-2948. Just send me a text. Just let me know what you're thinking. Um, I have it on buzz, so it's not going to be too distracting if you do it in the next five minutes, so it'll be all right. But uh, at any time that you are actually watching this and hearing this and, and engaging in this little short conversation, go ahead and text me. I, I'd love to hear from you. So please, talk amongst yourselves for a minute to, just to share about the journey that, that I talked about and uh, perhaps where your heart's at. Okay, I'll give you another 30 seconds or so to wrap up. All right, if I can call you back together, that'd be great. Thank you for engaging in conversation with each other, or I've received a, a number of texts and they're still rolling in, so thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Even some people here in this uh, gathering uh, in person have texted me, so that's awesome. Thank you so much. You know, it was not uh, until much later for me that after that church plant experience that I discovered what God had to say about all of this. Now, 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 to be sure, I knew about the Great Commission. I mean, I, I got it. But what I did not know was that God had planned all of this even before Jesus walked the earth. You see, 
I grew up thinking that the Israelites and my immigrant community had a lot in common. <laughs> we were the chosen people. And unless you jumped hoops and passed through fire, it was near to impossible for anyone to enter the chosen zone. So imagine my surprise when I was in a seminary and they started to share how God explicitly spoke about the expansion of his inclusion some 700 years prior to Christ. So here... Follow me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 56. We're going to be reading the first eight verses in Isaiah 56. I invite you to open up your Bible, whether it is in uh, your app or it is on your lap. I invite you to follow along. Even if it's a different translation than what I read, even if it's a different translation than what you see on the screen, it is still good for you to be reading that because even you know the, the variances of what you're reading is going to prompt questions in your mind. Why does it say this? Why does this? And it's just a great way to engage with the word of God by hearing it uh, spoken in different vo voices. So if you're using a different translation, that's fine. That's good. It's, it's, it's actually really good. So Isaiah 56 uh, verses 1 to 8. Um, and this is what it says. This is what the Lord says. Maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand, and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Blessed is the one who does this, the one who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. So pretty safe verses so far. This is a call to obedience, and, and you'll be blessed if you do it. That's what the Lord is saying in these first two verses, and then he carries on. Let no foreigner who has bound himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Key verse. And let not any eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. Before I carry on, let me just sidebar here about eunuchs. You know, this is, these verses here from 3 to 5 are really interesting verses, especially if you look at them in light of um, the whole LGBT in inclusion and, and that whole aspect. If we were to do a study, it's amazing. So perhaps we'll do that, uh, but not today, um, but just wanted to put a little plug in because I think there's something here that's key that, that reveals other things in the Bible that, that, that we could look at. Um, but uh, it carries on. So let me read verse 3a uh, again. It says, Let no foreigner who has bound himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to serve him, to, to love the name of the Lord and to worship him, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who, who hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring into my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The sovereign Lord declares. He who gathers the exiles of Israel, he declares, I will gather still others to them besides those that are already gathered. That's far the reading of God's word here this morning and all God's people said, Amen. So that verse 8 is, is really key um, and instrumental in really summarizing um, where we're going with all of this. That's uh, the fact that the Lord says that he who gathers the exiles of Israel, that he will gather still others. This verse opened my eyes to see that the Lord had planned all along that it would be more than the original chosen ones to be invited into a relationship with him. The Lord was planning to invite more than the Israelites to be his children. The Lord was planning to invite more than the CRC peoples to be his children. The Lord is inviting more than current Christ followers to be his brothers and sisters here on earth. The Lord God is an inclusionist. Jesus Christ was sent for all. His sacrifice is sufficient for all peoples to come to know him and the Father. Can I hear an amen? 
Amen. All right, now before I move on to answering the when question, let me recap everything that I have tried to convey to you with a drawing. Now, again, I am not a very good artist, but I'm going to give it my best shot, all right? And uh, so I'd like to talk to you about ranching and ranchers and their practices as we see it um, as a variant uh, around the world so to speak. So if, if we think of a North American rancher, what a North American rancher does is he claims a parcel of land. And the first thing he does is not only did he claim it, he then puts a fence all the way around it. So he fences it in and, and then, you know, he puts his cows in there. That looks like a cow, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so, like a longhorn cow. Are, are you with me? Okay, so the cows are in, in, in the field and, and they're bounded by this fence and, and typically it's, it's a barbed wire fence that is placed all the way around so as to keep the cows away from the fence and from leaving the place and it might even be that the, the, the barbed wire is there as well to, to keep other cows from coming in. So the fence is there to, to keep the cows separated from any other cows that might be there. Now, there might be in a function of keeping out predators, but every bear and every wolf I've ever met would, you know, that fence would be no problem for them. So, so maybe some ranchers then add some electricity to the fence in order as a further deterrent from anybody getting in or anybody getting out. Such are the practices of a North American rancher. In Australia, they would be given a parcel of land as well, but they do not put fences all the way around their property. Rather, what they do is they dig a well because they know that the cows are going to stay close to that well because why? Because the water is living water. It's, it's what gives them life. And so they're not really going to stray very far because they know they need to come back for the water. It's just natural. It's just inborn. Um, and so there's no need for fences in this scenario for them and how they ranch in Australia. So I'd like for you to... Ruminate. So just, just think about this as an analogy for what it might say to us about our church, about our church's attitudes, about our church's posture, about our church's um, practices. So I'm going to leave that with you. Uh, maybe we'll come back to it later, but I'll, I'll let that sit with you. So the question of when. When do we practice what we believe about God? When do we practice that he reveals himself to us and invites us to worship him in holistic fashion? When? The answer is that we practice all of that at all times and in all places. When we are out and about in our daily lives, at work, at home, at play, when we are in our neighborhoods, in our grocery stores, and in our department stores, when we are in our libraries, and when we are in our health fitness centers, when we are at the doctor's office or in the dentist chairs, when we are in our walks down the streets of our neighborhood or, or in our hikes in national parks, at all times and in all places, we practice what we believe. And at the risk of repeating something that perhaps you have already seen in a year or, or many gone by and you've already heard this, I'd like to show you a video clip of, of where we have been and where we need to go. And of course, it will highlight the answer to our question of when. Can we roll the video clip?
church leadership, all the churches, Bob, to get more involved in the church. We even know it's not going to be done. Bob would leave. Giving us a silly hobby to do his guidance by the end of the world. Eventually, Bob's friends begin wondering what happened to him. And their market is a critical part of the model of everyone's community. When they wander into a coffee shop, they ask, What happened to you? I miss you. Bob begins to realize that he's becoming an outsider in all the conversations, significant or otherwise, that always unfolded during their Wednesdays together. Bob explains that he found something more important than model of everyone's community. He even offered an invitation to Wednesday night church meetings. Some of the other ones went for out of the church. Because they respect and love Bob. But a lot of them decide not to go because they value the time together with family and friends on Wednesday evening. After some time, Bob becomes the key leader of the church and hears his call to go to reach those people who meet him in the club. Since giving up the regular meeting with the club, his interaction feels more difficult than he imagined. After all, Bob, their leader, left them for what seemed to be just another club on Wednesday evening. Somewhat troubled, Bob decides to take a break from Wednesday night church gathering and re enter the world of Model Everything. Some in the church are deeply concerned for Bob's spiritual well-being. Others are struggling. Then someone asks the question, what if we resource Bob to be even more effective at building healthy communities where he already is? Let's not put the better of our Lord Jesus' heart for compassion, generosity, peace, and love among people that know him best. After all, Bob is the most likely access point for those people to encounter Jesus. The church agrees. Bob's church has now determined that to follow Jesus and assist him in living out his faith in the community that Bob now sees both his dedication to his church and to the model everything community as a critical component to following Jesus. So when, when do we practice our faith? In all places and at all times. It's not just here on a Sunday morning in a a worship gathering that we practice our faith. We practice our faith every other hour of the week, 24-7. And then 52 times a year at that. And then again and again. We practice our faith in all places and at all times. And in order to do that, we, we need a posture of being welcoming open and trusting and inviting and receiving and again not just here on Sunday but we need that posture of being welcoming everywhere we go we are going to need the posture of that Australian rancher who knows that it is water that gives life to the cattle in the same way we know that it is Jesus who is the living water that gives life to all the people, that, and we gather around that. That's why we gather. When we do what it is that the Lord is inviting us to do, when we take on an open and inviting attitude, when we are trusting and having a receiving posture, Then, and only then, the Lord's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I'd like to close with this depiction of what heaven really looks like, with no dividing walls. Revelation 7, verses 1 to 3, and verses 9 to 12. Revelation 7. I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming in from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. And he said, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. And then in the next verses, that's in essence what happens. The completion of that occurs. And the Lord places his seal of ownership on his people. And verse 9 then says, And after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every tribe and nation and people and language just standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And, and they were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. 
And all the angels were standing around the throne and, and around the elders and around the four living creatures and they fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So may it be true of us that that is what we know that we are working towards, that that is what we get to practice here each and every day. So may it be true of us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord of maker of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, Holy Spirit, your Spirit, our advocate. Lord, as we spoke about earlier in the service, we need you. Oh, Lord, we need you. In order to live out... Uh, when we practice our faith, in, in order to, to, to live into that, we need you. So Lord, I pray for an extra measure of your Holy Spirit to be bestowed upon us all. At the beginning of this ministry, there was talk of a double portion of blessing, of your Spirit blessing us. And so Lord, we pray that upon each and every one of us, that we would indeed receive your Holy Spirit to the power that it would, we couldn't but resist, we can't resist what, what you're calling us to do. So be that God. Be our God. And help us to live in the way that you've called us to live. Giving honor and glory to you in all that we do everywhere we go. In your name we pray. Amen. Shut up.
Revelations is that picture of that which is to come. But Jesus Christ invites us to practice and to celebrate that each and every day. He invites us to, to do so here within our worship services in what we know is the sacrament of communion, the Lord's Supper. It is at that table that, that Jesus gathered with his disciples on the night before he was betrayed, on the, on, the, on the day before he died, on the day before he was placed in a tomb, he gathered with his disciples around the table. And in so many ways, this is such an example of, of how we can do this each and every day, that, that in the same way that all who profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that, that, that know he is the living water, in the same way, we are invited to the table to engage with the Lord our God, to remember and to believe. So as we gather, we won't be gathering around this table. At home, you're, you're sitting where you're sitting. Um, but I invite you that as you partake, as you engage in this sacrament, as you um, engage with the elements of, of the bread and the juice, that, that, that as you do that, that you would picture a table that is surrounded by people from every nation, tribe, and language gathered around the table from, from iniquity before us to iniquity beyond us to all the way around the globe. All these people who profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are gathered around the table. Would you picture that in your mind? Because it was on that night that Jesus was betrayed that he took bread. And after having given thanks for it, I imagine he held it up high and he said, Blessed are you, maker of heaven and earth, you who causes bread to come forth from the earth. He then broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then likewise, after the meal, he took the cup And having poured it, he also lifted it up and gave thanks for it as well, much in the same way he would have done for the bread, giving thanks to the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, he who causes juice to come forth from the earth. And then he gave it to his disciples, all those gathered around him at the table, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant of, of my blood poured out for the complete forgiveness of all your sins, of all your waywardness, of all your distractions, of all your rebellion. This is the cup. Take, drink, remember, and believe. And so I invite you at this time, those that are gathered here, to take out that little thimble that you have been given. It's uh, rather precarious in how you need to open it, but let's just have some fun with this. Try not to spill it on yourself. There is a small cellophane wrapper first that you peel back, and underneath the cellophane wrapper is the wafer. The wafer is the body. Then beneath the aluminum foil wrapper is the juice, access to the juice. And so I invite you to at least open the one at this point. The bread, if you're at home, whatever bread um, that you have prepared, um, please have it at the ready. And so I invite you once again 
to return to that vision of all the people that are gathered around the table? Would you envision your family? Would you envision ones that perhaps aren't at the table now, but you envision them there nonetheless? Envision the, the people of the, the river gathered around this table. Envision others that you know from other countries, tribes, and nations all gathered around the table. And then knowing that Jesus says to each and every one of us, take, eat, remember, and believe that my body was broken for you. And then with the juice ready before you, knowing that you have just received this from Jesus' hand, take, drink, remember and believe that Christ's precious blood was poured out for the complete forgiveness of all your sins. Amen and amen. with us, sing a song of celebration, we relish the goodness of God in this place in our lives, as we prepare to be that very goodness of God in the world, the presence of Christ all around us.
Perhaps you know it from Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. I'd like to uh, speak these verses to you as our blessing as we go from this place. But I'd like to speak these, uh, these verses in my own rendition, in my own paraphrase, if you will. So in your goings to and fro daily, invite others to meet Christ. Introduce them to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit walk alongside of them, teaching them to obey everything that the Lord has given to you on how to live in response to his goodness. Go in his peace and know that he is with you always to the very end of the age. Amen.